I'm ready. And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them on the web at sans.org to learn more. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And sponsored by Black Squirrel. Pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Great, but for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, mix yourself a sidecar, and give the intern control of your botnet, because here's your host. He's a man who's giving Jack a run for his money with the beard. Now, if he can only grow some on top. <laughs> Paul Asadorian! Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. This is episode 410 for Thursday, March 19th, 2015. Very excited to be here. I've got uh, quite the cast of characters here in studio, on the lines via Skype, and a whole list of guests coming up for the show that we're very excited about. Epic list of guests. Epic. Larry Pesci is here in studio. Yes. He and, to, and, it, some, and, uh, and you know what? It's weird. We can't see ourselves on a monitor. Yeah, it's no, like they're totally doing, weird. Yeah. They're, they're, they're playing with things. Yeah. They're, you know. Damn monkeys. Anyway. Yeah. So, I don't know. I kind of like it that I can't see myself. But I don't know. Uh, they'll figure it out. People can see us, though. That's the important yes, that's part. that's the important part. Yeah. So, you were saying I mixed up some old fashions? Old fashions. Old I haven't fashions. tried one yet, but... I'm yeah, still working on my sidecar. He's side still working car. on my sidecar. Yeah, he's the still, side car. He, he's still he's still working on the first drink. That's right, and it has a it's got a sugar rim on it and everything. It's pussy. It's very. <laughs> it's very nice. uh, Mr. Matt Alderman is here in studio from Tenable Network Security. Matt's the VP of Strategy. We're going to be talking to him about strategery. 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 You strategery. read the questions, strategery. right? Yeah, I, yeah, I read the questions. I'm good. Okay. They, they're kind of ridiculous. Well, there's one that's ridiculous in there. Uh, I'm sure just, you read. One. just one. Only one. <laughs> and the rest of them I'm good with. Yeah. Oh, and you have to answer the five questions. Yeah, no, with, no, I saw that one. And you saw the. Oh, yeah. you, did you see the fi ridiculous five questions? Yeah. So you cheated. No, you, I, only one of those are ridiculous. The other. The oh, other that's true. Five. One of the five questions yeah. is, is also ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. And that would be the three words to describe. I Never think, mind. I think that <laughs> Matt pretty much knew that we're ridiculous coming into this thing, so he was pretty well prepared. <laughs> On the lines via Skype, we've got Mr. Carlos Perez, who loves SSL. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Especially after How's it going, Carl? I was expecting some kind of like cursing in your native language when I uh, it said SSL. Now uh, my mother and my wife and daughters are in the room. Oh, <laughs> I see. You had to oh. clean it up. <laughs> I really don't like SSL. Yep. That's, why um, you, that's why you should swear in French, because it's like wiping your ass with silk. <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> what movie is that from? I've Those were the good sheets, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what you said last night. Also, on the live via Skype, we have not Kevin is here with us. Welcome, not Kevin. Hey, Paul. How's it going? How's it going, man? It's so nice to hear your voice. I'm glad you're you're back. Kevin, of course, works for Pony Express, one of our fabulous sponsors. Many of you know not Kevin from the, I want to say it's the 2600 show. That's what I always called it. What? Yeah, if you, if you listened about 20 years ago when I was three years old, and this high, but you can't see how high that is. Well, I was on Off the Hook for Off the Hook was yeah. the official name of the show, and I used to listen to that show and always listen to Kevin's voice. And he was like, "I don't, I don't do that show anymore." You know, like I live in Boston now, and I'm like, "Dude, you should come on," because I, and, I miss not Kevin. And you know what was really dumb? I should have put the connection together, and I should have called not Kevin because I was in Boston Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this That's week. That's right. Oh, oh come on! Oh, don't fail. worry, I'll be. Don't worry, I'll be back. I'll be back. Beer and everything. I'll well, be. Seth is in Boston too. You could have made it double. Day. Oh, look at. Um, Come on. I'm yeah. in D.C. Oh, that's right. You are in D.C. <laughs> well, I'm used to seeing you in Boston. Uh, so, uh, speaking of Boston, we will be at B-Sides Boston. 
And that is happening at some time. I don't have it in my notes, but Google search for B-Sides Boston. Our listeners know how to do that, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll be presenting there on vulnerability management, coincidentally. They actually accepted my talk on vulnerability management. Really? Yeah. Like you're an expert or something. Like I'm some kind of expert on it or something. Um, <laughs> and the talk is all, really all about if a robot, a ninja, and a pirate get into a fight and how that relates to vulnerability management. I don't. I, I thought Jack said I, he thought I could pull it off. So he's probably like, "There's no uh, way Paul actually, can pull this uh, off." Exactly. You should totally <laughs> submit this. He's laughing. And his he's, ass he's off gonna right be now. in. The, he's gonna be there yeah. too. And he's gonna be laughing at me the whole time while I'm presenting, going, "Ha ha." But so, you know. Yeah. But you know what? You're gonna fucking pull it off. I, I hope. <laughs> so. I, I know I you. So. I, I, I know you. I haven't built the. Pre- I have a notes. I haven't built the actual presentation yet. So that should be fun. I hear. That's you. the fun part. Yes. Saturday, May 9th is Besides Boston. Now, that reminds me, Paul. Next week is Mid Atlantic CCDC. Yes, you'll which be there. I will be there, so I probably won't. I don't know if I'll be on the show or not, but uh, I just found out today that I've got 15 minutes to introduce the badges to the students, and I haven't come up to the pro with a presentation yet. Yeah, you'll be fine. I think I'm going to do it Prezi style. Yeah, no. no. Yes. Ooh. It's Pre- I, no, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be Prezi with all internet memes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Students love that. <laughs> exactly. Well, they know they know it well from Facebook. So they exactly. Know they'll feel like they're exactly. at home. So make sure you visit Security Weekly forward slash IoT where you can register for my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments, for the rest of us. There's. I wish I could talk about what we're working on for that class and some offshoot projects from it, but I can't. You're just going to have to wait. You should sign up for the class. I bought a lot of really ridiculously cheap, horrible wireless routers for the class that you'll all get to play around with in class. And hopefully not brick like Nick did this week. Actually, I told Nick, I'm like, I'd be disappointed if you didn't brick one. I'm like, I'm surprised it took you this long. But he recovered, so we're all, yep. we're all good. And, so Paul, and, Paul, how many did we seriously brick doing our Just book? one. Just one. And that was because it was that stupid, stupid pin where you had pin. to short the pins yep. together. Because we mashed the pins and the solder it was, it, so it was permanently bridged. So it, was, it was permanently in reset. It was for science. Yes. Um, They're D-Link routers, right? They're with Linksys. Yes. Oh, They're actually, the ones I bought are okay. Linksys, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Larry's teaching SAN 617 wireless ethical hacking and defense coming up in Orlando, Austin, Baltimore, and Berlin, Germany. And, so And more coming to a oh. end of the year you, near you. should you. just take that class with Larry, no matter where you are in the world. Yes. Yes. See, they're excited about it. You hear them yelling? Larry? I do. I do. Security Week listeners receive 10% off products at our store. Discount code IHACKNAKED. Also, check out Source Boston. I don't know if I'll be speaking there. I submitted. We'll see if they accept my submission or not. But... Uh, so you should submit if you have talk ideas for Source Boston. It's happening the end of May. So Source Boston 2015. Okay. I want to bring on our fabulous first guest, Pablo Holman. Pablo's a hacker inventor with a unique view into breaking and building new technologies. Pablo is a member of the Shmoo Group. He's done TED Talks, DEF CON Talks, talked about how to suppress hurricanes and other interesting topics that you just you have to go watch his TED Talks. It's awesome. Or you can listen to him talk about some of that stuff in our interview right now. Pablos, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to have you. So, Pablos, how did you get your start in information security? Oh, uh, I think it was just by not starting anything else. I mean, I, you know, I started out with an Apple II, and those things were pretty much useless, and all you could do was <laughs> hacking. And so, um, it's true. So, you know, I kind of grew up just trying to poke at computers and make them do shit. And, wow. um, Po- po- eventually, Apple, you know, you eventually they got faster and could actually do shit. And I was still trying to break them. So I don't know. I think um, once we started putting them on networks, um, you know, then, then things got a little more significant for security. And I ended up just playing with uh, it's like, I don't know, it's like a bottomless pit of puzzles, computer security. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up doing some of that just by default, I suppose. And now, how did you get involved with the Schmoo Group, Bubbles? Well, the Schmoo Group um, started out, uh, so I grew up in Alaska, mm. in the cold and the dark, and, um, and that's where the Schmoo Group actually started. So I knew uh, Bruce and the other guys who were in the Schmoo Group when it started, and I, I think I just, I, I think I was like a, you know, de facto member of the Schmoo Group just because I was around. Um, and so then, you know, what we were trying to do in those days was, uh, 
I mean, we, we in those days we thought we were going to make shit secure. Is really the truth. I mean, we <laughs> like go fix this security problem and then get back on to uh, doing cool stuff with computers. And and it took us a while to figure out that that was never going to happen. And so um, uh, after I figured out that I wasn't ever going to win, I I think I um, got less enthusiastic about trying to to secure stuff. So I don't work on that stuff too much anymore. It, it, I think that's very interesting, Pablo's, because you said, you know, the, the security problem is not what I'm going to solve, but I'm going to tackle solving things like hurricanes and malaria and doing things with nuclear <laughs> Much waste. More those, are, yeah, those are way easier than the security <laughs> things. Your computer secure is a lost cause. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome! So, but, but uh, we can you, fix global warming. Right? Yeah, we can. Global warming is yet. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Pablo, tell people how you you kind of uh, grew to the position that you have today, and and some of the yeah. things that you do. Well, the basic you know trajectory is you know I my whole life I've been trying to do new things with computers, and you guys have done some of that. You know, just like imagining that someday this thing will be bigger and faster and have more memory, and we'll finally be able to do something cool. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, someday I'll be able to play music on my computer. And someday I'll be able to, like, make the graphics move and, you know, that kind of thing. And eventually they could do those things. And now, um, you know, I think I just never stopped doing that. So most of my work has been always trying to take computers and cram them into places where they haven't been before. And um, Sounds dirty. Sometimes, yeah, maybe they shouldn't be. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so I think, you know, like... Uh, by the time, I mean, like, I don't know, like in, I got online in like 1983 or something, right? And so I was a kid and I was like trying to, we wrote these programs called like mail bombs, you know, which you would think of as a virus now, you know, but we were trying to like send email attachments that would lock people out of their accounts and give us access to everything and stuff, you know? So that's like kind of by the the early start for me in breaking shit. And I think what happened after that is like, you know, as the networks got built out more and more people got online and then by by the early 90s when, you know, when we started getting a lot more people online, web browsers and stuff, you know, I was just trying to figure out what to do. I tried to start a web development company to make web apps in 1994, which was way too early. <laughs> um, and people had never even heard of web pages and so you couldn't really talk them into I was like like no forget web pages let's make web apps and then you know by like the late 90s we were trying to use computers to trade stocks um, and to you know use AI systems that could read the news which um, it was a little too soon to do that I mean we had to have huge piles of computers that ended up with like less computational ability than your iPhone um, and we were trying to make them run expert systems to read the news and, and trade stocks, which was uh, a little too early, but it worked out eventually, you know. Um, and then after that, um, you know, by that time, I'd just done enough crazy projects that, um, you know, people would call me whenever they wanted to do something crazy. And so I ended up going to work for Jeff Bezos, hmm. uh, not at Amazon, but to build spaceships. And so he had this idea that he could make his own space program since he was rich. And um, uh, he was right. So we started this lab to do research projects on crazy ways of getting into space um, besides rockets. And, um, and I did that for a while. Uh, I worked on that with Neil Stevenson, who you might know, science fiction novelist, most hackers know. Um, and then we ended up deciding to build a rocket ship. So I left and started trying to build the world's smallest PC. And so we did a whole bunch of this miniaturization work, you know, trying to figure out how to make computers smaller so you didn't have to sit at your desk all day. Um, and that was OQO, which is, you know, kind of a prototypical um, miniaturization of a computer. And a lot of that technology is what makes iPhones and iPads possible now. Um, but again, the company was too soon and too cool and too expensive. And um, and so then uh, I realized eventually that, you know, um, working on new technologies, you're just like wrong a lot about how long it's going to take for it to come to market and be um, be real. So I started working for Nathan Mirvold when he started 
the lab at Intellectual Ventures. And so what we do is we just invent stuff. And what's great about that is I can be wrong and I can be early and uh, I can be, you know, I can invent things way too soon. And that's okay because all we do is invent stuff. And then we make our money by selling that out and starting companies and things that eventually make products, but we don't do that. So that's really that's cool. So Pablos, what's the, you know, having a background in hacking uh, and yeah. so doing that, you know, some of that, I would categorize some of what you do as hacking today. Yeah. What's the intersection between inventing and, and hacking? Well, that's the beautiful thing is that like, you know, what people don't realize is that, you know, invention is fundamentally this discovery process, right? It's fundamentally about figuring out what's possible. And you don't figure out any new inventions by reading the directions, right? You have right. to try <laughs> shit. And that's what hackers are optimized for. Hackers never read the directions. They're like violating the warranty before they got something out of the box, you know? And so I think of hackers as like, you know, really like optimized inventors because they'll just try everything and see what happens. And that's absolutely necessary. It's how you get every new invention. It's how you get every new technology. And if you skip that step, you don't get anything new. What you get is the same thing you had yesterday. And so, um, so what I've been trying to do is kind of rescue some hackers out of computer security departments and get them working on invention again because that's what we need their minds for. Um, mm. And I think of that process as being really the same thing. You know, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, I mean, most of the time, hackers don't even know what they're doing when they start out. They're just like poking at their computers. But, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, you're like testing stuff. You know, I'm just going to fuzz this interface or I'm just going to like try every possible thing and see what falls in my lap. And that's, and that's how you figure out what's possible. And we need to do that to other things besides, you know, besides firewalls and shit. So yeah, that's ca ca case in case in point, a uh, um, pneumatic use schmooball launcher. Yeah, yeah. Pablo, you were like the first one to do the schmooball launcher thing, right? I guess that's true. Yeah, I guess I made the first schmooball launcher. <laughs> and Pablo, so you know that uh, they got banned from ShmooCon for two years because of me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I got banned from ShmooCon because of my own damn conference uh, because of uh, my gas-powered schmooball launcher. That was that was not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, you, so, for for me, Pablo, you were the inspiration for a lot of mine because I saw that and I said, you know what? If Pablo's can do that, uh, maybe yeah. I can do it better. I, and, that's pretty much that's the whole point of my career. Is if you see me do something, hopefully you'll try to do it better. That's, that's awesome. That's exactly the right idea. So, what was your Move all on. Uh, so uh, many over many iterations, we had a sort of a handheld pistol uh, that oh. had a uh, uh, paintball container, uh, paintball air container in a backpack. Yeah. Um, another that one that was an actual cannon, um, and the final iteration was actually mounted to one of those like Barbie jeeps, and it was fully <laughs> remote controlled with a turret and would do elevation, and it was uh, eight shots if I recall, because a buddy of mine, uh, Darren and I, uh, built a, uh, a semi-automatic loading breach on on the Schmooball launcher with some linear actuators and an Arduino and. And um, dude, that was the highest velocity one you ever created because I remember standing in the room and after you shot it, I thought you killed Bruce Potter. Yes. Like I really thought he was <laughs> yes. dead. I have a video. I yes, so I, I shot Bruce with that during opening ceremonies, and I was. I think he still has the yeah, scar in his rib cage. Yeah, we, with permission, and we're about halfway down one of those massive conference rooms yeah. in the aisle, and it was pointed at Bruce, and he stepped away from the podium as, as he was talking, and it hit him, and he had his hand up, hit him in the rib cage, and he said he had a schmoo ball sized bruise and welt for a month. <laughs> <laughs> that, and then. Beautiful. They banned schmooball candies. Yes, and then they, and then they banned the, and then they banned the schmooball. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, you got to move on. <laughs> That's right. This is true. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Pablo, so you talk about hacking like big things, like malaria and hurricanes and global warming. Are there were there specific skills that you and some of the other hackers that worked on those projects were able to apply to that? You want to kind of give people well, a little background on some of those projects? Yeah, I mean, the basic idea, you know, for us is that. 
you know, we're trying to find ways of scaling up invention, right? And part of that is, is that, you know, we just think that there's more problems all the time. Humans are making more problems and we need to invent solutions to them. And so uh, the problem with that is that, you know, invention is kind of a weird thing. Like it's usually like you know, crazy hair in a garage. There's not like, there's nobody investing in inventors. You know, it's, you're kind of on your own. And so we're trying to fix that. So we have different ideas about how you might, how you might improve that, you know, like I, um, but a big one is that we think you just have to do it at a larger scale. So with invention, you're going to be wrong, like almost all the time. So what we do is um, we just do a lot of it. And um, we became the biggest patent filer in America most years um, on our own invention work. We probably file five or 600 patents a year now. And the point of that is that like, you know, out of 500, like, maybe one of them is going to be a big hit, you know, this is like our odds are just low. And so, um, so we try to increase our odds. So like the way that we do our in-house invention work most of the time is we kind of turned it into a team sport where we'll try to find a big problem and then we'll just get a nuclear physicist, a laser expert, a chemist, a computer hacker collectively we know the cutting edge in every area in science and technology. And we're gonna get all those guys together and try to invent together. And that's why we come up with crazy inventions that are at the borders of different areas in science and technology. So you know, the one we're most notorious for is this machine that finds mosquitoes flying around in the sky and then shoots them down with laser beams. And that's a malaria intervention. You know, malaria still kills almost a million people a year. It's the low hanging fruit. I mean, we can absolutely eradicate malaria in our lifetime, but we have to, you know, have to go and add some tools to the arsenal and we have to try. And so, um, so we're trying to help. And, but that's an example of the kind of invention you wouldn't get if you were working on malaria in Africa for your whole career, right? Because you don't know about lasers, and you don't know about machine vision, and you don't know what the you know cost of a laser galvo is or something. So there's lots of things like that that we can bring to invention by combining different kinds of experts, um, and that's that's a lot of how we go about our invention work. Um, but the but to make it worth doing, we aren't just you know it doesn't make sense for us to like invent a better fart app for the iPhone. We need to like. <laughs> take on big problems, right? So what we're trying to do is find, I mean, that's what matters to me is just find the biggest problems, technical problems, you know, not like relationship problems. Like we need to find like good technical problems to solve that are hard and big. And so um, for the humanitarian stuff like malaria, uh, we work with Bill Gates on that stuff. He hangs out at the lab, we invent with him. He funds those, those projects. Um, and then we'd also do a lot of like commercial invention as well. Um, and then that stuff, we, we license it out or sell it or start up companies. And now, Pablo, you did some, some cool stuff on cooking. Right. Produce the world's most expensive cookbook. Have you yeah. ever thought of extending that into cocktails? Because we're really big into cocktails here. Yeah. And I'd love a way to like get better, more efficient <laughs> cocktails or something like that. I think that should absolutely be the plan. It turns out we... We made a 50 pound cookbook and we didn't manage to cover baking at all. So right now we're working on baking. So and the last I heard, they're up to like four volumes on baking. So I don't even know how big that book's gonna be. Wow. But yeah, I would have prioritized cocktails over baking, but um, right now it's baking. So if you wanna do the cocktail thing and you need someone who like, likes to sample cocktails, I'm more yeah. than happy to come down to the lab. I knew you guys would turn out to be useful. <laughs> And if you want the real sidecar, I'll help give you the recipe because That's Paul's right. isn't any good. Apparently, I, I, I you know what? Today, you know what, Pablo's? So. I like to invent too, and I invented my own version of the sidecar. And like you said, yes. most inventions don't turn out so good. They fail the first time. They fail, and I failed. But you know what? I got back up, and I'm going to try again. You're going to get back on the horse. That's right. He's going to follow my directions. Well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, I'm a hacker. I didn't read the directions the first time. <laughs> 
That's how we know. That's right. Um, so, Pablo's what? Uh, looking into the future now, we've talked about a couple of projects you've worked on already. But where do you see some major science and technology breakthroughs that are coming in the next twenty or fifty years? Well, you know, I don't really try to guess that far out. Like, you know, my patents will expire in twenty years, so mm. I try to work on a five yeah. to ten year horizon. Okay, right? fifty years. You can make up any bullshit you want. For Flying cars! Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to leave it open-ended for you. No, yeah, we'll all be dead, so there's just no accountability about whether you're right or not. Like, I don't, I don't think that's a very useful thing to do. Um, but that said, like, you know, what you've got to look at is the fundamental pieces that we're working with. You know, we're using these, these sort of technological building blocks, and we get, you know, I don't know, a a major breakthrough once every generation or so. Um, you know, in our lives, almost, you know, 99% of what has happened has been due to the transistor, right? It's just computers, computers, computers. And we've used them for everything we can think of so far. We, you know, we're, we're finding it all the little cracks. I mean, I kind of cheated invention by just looking around at all the places where computers haven't gone yet and imagine what happens if we put a computer in your sidecar? Which sounds crazy, but you know, in five or 10 or 20 years, we probably will have a computer in there, at least gauging your intake so we know what, you know, what alcohol works best for you and correlate it to what the experience is like for you the rest of the day, you know? We'll get there. Um, I think there are other places where computers haven't gone yet, and we need to go look into that. So that's gonna be happening over, you know, the next couple decades. We're just gonna go, you know, computers got so small and cheap that we're just gonna put them everywhere and you're gonna see that happening. And that's the kind of thing that's kind of incremental development from here on out. You know, we're not inventing any new technologies there really, as far as like, you know, there's nothing on par with the transistor that's gonna come along. Um, but, you know, that's the predictable stuff, right? Someday, you know, you may get a Nikola Tesla coming along inventing something cool. You may get a Bell Labs coming along inventing something cool that could change everything, but we can't predict those things. Um, but what we can see is that there's a whole lot of mileage left in computers. Mm -hmm. And that's what's exciting to me. I mean, I really feel like we're just at the beginning. You know, people are still doing my first Sony shit with their computers. Now that we have this surplus of computational ability, I mean, you guys lived through this, you know, my, my Apple II, one kiloflop, right? Mm -hmm. I would just fantasize about getting my hands on a Cray XMP, 400 megaflops. Could you imagine what you could do with all that processing power? You're hauling around 115 gigaflops in your pocket mm -hmm. right now. And now the computation for the first time has exceeded our imagination. And so that's why we're making fart apps. But there's so much we can do. And I think that that's why, you know, you know I think that, you know, for, for the rest of my natural life, it's just going to be figuring out what we can do with computers to make things better. And, 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 and you know, you can, you can pretty easily see, like, how that has played out in your life so far. You can mm -hmm. extrapolate a lot of ways what's going to be possible that, that hasn't been so far. And... Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's what all of us should be doing. You know, we have a lot of skills and knowledge and experience working on computers our whole lives. And, and we can imagine better than other people, like, what, what could happen and what could be possible and, and become practical. And, and you know what? I, I think based on, uh, on Pablo, so about what you just said about uh, us having this, uh, po uh, you know, this uh, overabundance of computing cycles and being able to make computers smaller, cheaper, and stuffing them in everywhere. And... I, I think you may have, in fact, just solved the entire computer security industry. And and I say that by, you know, we're, we're very worried about the Internet of Things now, right? Yeah. Everything being connected to the Internet and being hackable and, oh, my gosh, how do we secure that? Well, you know how we secure that? We flood the market and we flood the environment with so many possible computing devices in so many various places that there just isn't enough manpower and or care in the world to hack every single one of these devices. Well, that may be, I don't know. That, 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 Call that, me crazy. That might, that might break down on you because, you know, what, 
what's really happened, I mean, why it's different, why computer security is different than other kinds of security is just because they're all on the network and the cost of attacking everything isn't that much more than the cost of attacking one thing. And that's different than like when you talk about, you know, like using an analogy of like houses in a village or something, you know, the cost of attacking additional houses is linear. And that's not really true when, you know, when, when you've got, you know, bots attacking everything. And so um, I don't know if I buy that, but what I do think is that, you know, the game is absolutely here to stay. You know, there is a difference in how secure, you know, your house might be from your neighbor's house or from, you know, the, you know, the office building that you work in or something. And you'll always be able to like, you know, make yourself not the low hanging fruit, but you'll never be able to make yourself totally secure. That's what I think. And I don't think the, I don't think the game is likely to change in the sense that we're not gonna win. We're not gonna make things secure. It's not gonna end. There will always be bad actors with a, you know, economic incentive to, to keep trying and with time on their hands to fuck around. And, you know, you could see it happen like in America, you guys know, when we were, you know, up until like 9-11, you couldn't give away a code audit or any kind of security services. Nobody bought anything. After that, every company got security as a line item on their budget. And that's why this industry exists. That's why hackers are security professionals now, you know? And that's, you know, that's really what's changed. Is in America, we don't even have criminal hackers that much, you know? They all have a job making six figures configuring IDS systems somewhere. So there's not really a, um, a, a class of criminal hackers in America anymore. And that, because the incentive's taken away. And there is outside of America. And, and I think that, you know, when you look at the real, um, you know, what's really happening with the expansion of the relevance of hacking and, you know, hacking computers. I mean, I think about it this way. If you had, if you were any country in the world besides America, would you rather control our land or our computers? Computers. Computers, because then you can yeah. control the well, land. Well, we're set up pretty well to defend the land. Mm. Yep. <laughs> but I don't think anyone's coming for it. You know, the economic value is in the corporations, it's in the computers that, that they run, and that's, you know, that's where the action is. Yep, and subsequently, if you control the computers, you can essentially control the land. Yeah, in a way, that's true, yeah. Because if you, if you make all of your adversaries' computers go away, then they have a hard time <laughs> defending the land. Mm. Yeah, that's 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 really true these days. I think I think that was on an episode of CSI Cyber, wasn't it? No, that, no, that was a roller coaster. <laughs> oh, it was a roller coaster, <laughs> right? Uh, so, pa Pablo's. Um, uh, in terms of uh, some newer technology, we had these ridiculous notions that Amazon was going to start delivering packages over drones. Sure. Like, what's your take on the drone technology when combined with like wireless and big data and cloud and cameras and stuff? Yeah, I mean, you know, all of these things are common. It's, you know, it's just essentially inevitable. There's like the drone thing. That's not a joke. I mean, there's actually reasons to try and make it work. I don't know how hard it's going to be or how long it's going to take or how the regulatory environment is going to pan out or what the, you know, economic uh, incentive to make it work is. You know, Amazon's going to keep developing stuff and see what sticks. And that's a great thing about how they operate, right? They're just going to try everything and see what sticks. Um, and, and I think, you know, in that sense, like, Amazon hires hackers in a way that other companies don't, you know, because they want to just try stuff and they've got the money to do it. Um, other people want to know exactly what they're going to do when they start out. And it's different, different kind of companies. Drones, you know, I think it's really going to change what's possible in, in uh, air, you know, in aerial transport, right? You, you know, the planes we fly now all basically work like the planes we the Howard Hughes bill, right? Mm -hmm. And we've strapped on a few band-aids here and there and some new technologies here and there to kind of make, you know, check if things are going wrong and we've made them quite reliable. But you could make 
you could architect radically different types of flying vehicles and things. Those are engineering problems. Those are problems that have to do with, um, with uh, uh, you know, market incentives to develop a new product. But the point is, fundamentally, it's the exact same thing I said before. It's just taking a computer and cramming it into a flying object. That changes what you can do. And, and, and so, you know, we're going to cram our computers into flying objects. We're going to cram our computers into our cars. We're going to cram them into everything else. And we're going to see if we can make them do cool new shit that, you know, that computers do whenever you cram them in places. And that's, that's, that's why I think it's kind of easy. You know, you could ask me what I think, but I think you guys can imagine just as well, like, what that means. Pelos, one question. Um, you come from a security background, and now uh, you're working more on in, inventing, improving stuff. How does coming from a security background kind of influence when you're doing invention and looking into new stuff? Do you actually start thinking on ways of how people can abuse this? How can I make this secure? Or you don't focus on that and more on kind of the overall picture? Well, there are times when we're trying to anticipate a certain, you know, a class of problems that's informed by the fact that we know about security. You know, so for example, uh, year, you know, almost a decade ago, um, we started trying to imagine what it would take to to incorporate some kind of DRM into 3D printed objects, uh -huh. right? Which is at the time. Nobody had even seen a 3D printer, but we had them in the lab. These days, everybody's heard of 3D printing. Um, they still don't make anything anybody wants to buy. But you know, you could imagine someday it'd be nice if you could tell if a if an item was was forged or not, right? Um, for different reasons, and you know, maybe just for quality control, if nothing else. Um, but you know, those are the kinds of things that you're you know, sort of clued into if you worked on security. You know, when you're building a product, you just got to build a product and try and attract some customers and make it work for the people who want it to work. You don't have time to think about all the perverted things that hackers are going to do to it. And so um, that's, that's just a kind of fundamental economics. If you tried to think about those things, you get your ass kicked by a competitor um, who got bigger market share than you. And that's just what happens over and over and over again. Occasionally, you get out in front far enough that you can then go back and deploy some resources. You know, Google got big enough fast enough, Microsoft got big enough fast enough, Apple got big enough fast enough that they can go hire security experts to go strap security on as a requirement when they build products. But even then, they do it all retroactively. You know, they build it, ship it, see what breaks, then go fix it. That's going to continue to be the paradigm for as long as I'm alive, as far as I can tell, I don't see anything else happening. There's nobody who's going to go design secure products from the ground up. Every one of those has failed. Hmm. Pablos, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh, shit. Sign me up. <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. Oh. Um, uh, hacker, inventor, salsa dancer. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, Captain Crunch. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, uh, implementing science fiction. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> Uh, I have a lot more experience going first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive or dead? Oh. Um, um, Alan Turing and Nikola Tesla. Wow. Oh. Pablos, thank you very much for appearing on Security Week. It was awesome chatting with you. Keep up the great Thanks, work. Guys. We look forward to hear, seeing your uh, talks uh, and ideas of what you're working on. It's very fascinating. I love it. Cool. Thanks, you guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Pablos. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and bring on our next special guest for this evening, Seth Geftik, who's been patiently waiting there. Thank you, Seth. We had some 
uh, interesting scheduling things. We're going to go past time on the show. The production staff is going crazy. Like, ah, time. I'm like, forget time. We're in a space-time continuum on the show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 